Okay, we left off here at question 20.19. We have um, benzoic anhydride. So this would be instead of benzoic acid, right? It's a derivative of benzoic acid. So this is benzoic anhydride. And then we have phenol. Well, phenol is going to be the nucleophile in this case. And I'm not going to draw the entire mechanism, but we know that when we take um, an anhydride, so if we have an anhydride and we saw this a few slides ago and we combine it with an alcohol, we end up with we end up with an ester like this, right? And we don't need a base like pyridine. And so let's draw what we'd end up with in this case. So we're going to end up with the portion of our anhydride. So we'll draw the phenyl. We have the carbonyl. And then now it's going to be attached to this part of our alcohol. So we have the oxygen and then we have the phenyl like this. So this is actually called phenyl benzoate, um, which is an ester. And then we're also going to be left over with some benzoic acid, right? Because that's what is going to be a byproduct from the reaction. And since benzoic acid is not a strong acid, that's why we don't have to have pyridine. There's no pyridine required here because benzoic acid is a weak acid. So this is the ester that's formed. And then the carboxylic acid, benzoic acid, is a byproduct of the reaction. So I'll put that over there. Next, we're taking um, propionic anhydride. That's this molecule right here. And we're treating it with a secondary amine. And if you're wondering, you know, where are you getting these from, Mr. Dion? Well, look, I'm going to go back here. I have my anhydride. Here it's acetic, acetic anhydride, but we're using propionic anhydride. And we're treating it with a secondary amine, and it tells us that it's excess. So this is a secondary amine. So we're going to end up with a secondary amide. So let's draw that secondary amide that we would get. We have this portion coming from my anhydride. So let's draw that out. That's going to look like this. Then we have the nitrogen, and it's got two ethyl groups attached to it. So we end up with one, two ethyl groups like that. Now, again, the reason that we have excess is because if you were to just write out a balanced equation with one equivalent of this, you would also end up with propanoic acid. But instead of ending up with propanoic acid, since you have excess of this in your reaction mixture, you actually end up with the propanoate and you end up with the ammonium ion of the diethylamine. So you actually end up with this, okay? And this will be discussed even more as we move along in the class. But again, we end up with um, a, sec, um, a tertiary amide. Tertiary amide. There we go. All right. Well, let's move on to section 20.10 where we talk about esters. And we're going to start by talking about their preparation. There's a few ways to make esters. This is a pretty cool way here. It says you can make um, an ester using a carboxyl group and doing an SN2 reaction with it. You see that in the first step, we're treating it with sodium hydroxide. What's that going to do? That's going to abstract the acidic proton so that you end up with a carboxylate, which is going to behave as a nucleophile when it reacts with a molecule like methyl iodide, right? It's just an SN2 reaction like this. So it's almost like, I have in my notes, I said a little bit like a Williamson ether synthesis, right? You're making an oxygen carbon bond with an oxygen that is behaving as a nucleophile. So it's a two-step process. So that's a new way to make an ester. But there are other, even more common methods for making esters. Let me show you one of the most common methods to make an ester, and it is the Fischer esterification. Out of all the mechanisms that you learn in organic chemistry, Fischer esterification is one of the most important mechanisms, and it comes up oftentimes on standardized exams, uh, that involve organic chemistry, whether it's an MCAT, a DAT, or a PCAT, or anything like that. So a Fischer esterification is a reaction in acidic conditions that occurs between an alcohol and a carboxylic acid. Now you notice that the reaction is equal, in equilibrium here, but we can take advantage of Le Chatelier's principle in order to get the, react, to get the reaction to go to the product side to give us the ester 
by removing the water. So we can use a special distillation technique to remove the water, and that would push the reaction to this side. Now notice that it says down here, the mechanism is consistent with one that occurs under acidic conditions. So what's the first step of our reaction mechanism going to be? Right, methanol is a weak nucleophile, right? And this isn't all that reactive. And so the first step must be a proton transfer to render the carboxylic acid reactive enough to react with that alcohol, which again is a weak nucleophile. So let's take a look. The first step is a proton transfer with our acid. Remember, the reason why the acid is a protonated molecule of methanol is because we have methanol in a strong acid, right? The H plus, right, that represents something like sulfuric acid, for example. So let's say it represents H2SO4. If we have H2SO4 in methanol, methanol, the equilibrium is going to lie mostly to the side of protonated methanol, which is the main acid in your reaction mixture, plus the conjugate base of sulfuric acid. So that's why we have this as our acid. So after we protonate the carbonyl, now this is a powerful electrophile, and methanol, which is a weak nucleophile, can do a nucleophilic attack on such a great electrophile. Well, now that that's happened, we remove a proton from what was formerly methanol, and we do another proton transfer. It's like two successive proton transfers in order to render the hydroxyl a good leaving group, or to convert it, I should say, into a good leaving group and to eject the water molecule. So the loss of our leaving group is water. Then another equivalent of methanol can come in and do a deprotonation to give us our ester, plus we end up with more of the protonated methanol, which takes us right back to this. And that's why when we have, and I've explained this to you before, that when you see these square brackets, it means that this is a catalyst. That means we don't need a lot of this. We only need maybe 0.1 equivalents. We don't need to have a molar quantity. Now, there's been some labeling experiments done with the Fisher esterification to prove the mechanism. If you take a radio labeled methanol with the oxygen being a radio labeled oxygen, and you look to see where the oxygen ends up, you see that it ends up in the ester. So this is proof of the Fisher esterification mechanism that we saw on the previous slide. Now again, notice that this is an equilibrating process. And so again, in order for us to get the reaction to go towards the product, towards the ester, we have to remove the water. And this is where this little interesting apparatus comes into play. This again is called a Dean, a Dean Stark apparatus. You can Google that. I'm not going to go over it in class uh, on, on our class time. However, it is a way to remove water from a reaction mixture. It's very clever and it's very simple. Now, esters can also be made by reacting an acid chloride with an alcohol in the presence of pyridine. Again, the reason that we need pyridine is let's say we didn't have the pyridine. Then you would be left over with HCl. And having HCl as a byproduct is a bad thing. We don't want to have HCl as a byproduct because it can cause all kinds of side products. So what we do is we add pyridine and then the HCl combines with the pyridine and we don't have pyridine and HCl, they combine to give us pyridinium hydrochloride, which is harmless, okay? This is not gonna cause any deleterious effects to our reaction. So now we've got Fischer esterification. We've got the first method we looked at, the SN2 with the carboxylate. And now we've got the reaction of an acid chloride with an alcohol. So with that in mind, let's take a look at question 20. 0.20. It simply asks us to identify the reagents that we would use for all three of these methods for taking benzoic acid, benzoic acid, and converting it into ethyl benzoate. So this is just me practicing my ester nomenclature. Well, what are our, our ideas? First, we could use sodium hydroxide to make the carboxylate, followed by treatment with ethyl 
iodide, so ethyl iodide. Um, a second way down here would be to treat it with um, ethanol and a catalytic amount of acid and to remove water. So this is the Fischer esterification, okay? And then the last one, another one, since we're starting it with a carboxylic acid, we can't use that directly. So first we'd have to treat it with thionyl chloride to make the acid chloride, right? And then we could treat it with um, ethanol and pyridine together. So all three of these ways can be used to convert benzoic acid into ethyl benzoate. So you see how a good organic chemist should always have a couple of ways of doing any kind of transformation that she or he would want to do in the lab. Let's take a look at some reactions of esters. What kind of reactions can an ester um, undergo? Again, another important reaction in organic chemistry is what we call saponification. Saponification is the hydrolysis of an ester under basic conditions. So we can hydrolyze an ester in acid. We'll look at that in a second. And we can hydrolyze an ester in base. When you hydrolyze it in base, it's got a special name. It's called saponification. If you look up hydrolysis of an ester in base or hydrolysis of animal fat in base, um, or just Google saponification, you'll probably come up on YouTube with all kinds of videos of people making soap from uh, animal fat in, in, or tallow or suet or something, and they're treating it with base, like a base like potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide, and they actually make soap. Well, the soap making process is only the first step here. That's the hydrolysis under basic conditions. But the thing is, after you hydrolyze an ester in base, you don't end up with an acid, you end up with the conjugate base of a carboxylic acid. And then in the second step, you treat it with acid to make the carboxylic acid. Again, that's what's saying right here. Acidic workup, the second step, is required to obtain the neutral carboxylic acid product. Again, a very important reaction in organic chemistry, a saponification reaction. This is the mechanism. It is a mechanism that you definitely need to know. It could be asked on the next quiz or on your final exam. The first step is a nucleophilic attack by hydroxide, right? Hydroxide is a very strong nucleophile, very strong nucleophile. So it's going to react with the ester group. It's in equilibrium, but it's going to react. We end up with a tetrahedral intermediate, and we're going to lose the alkoxide, which then does a proton transfer, and we end up with the carboxylate. And again, that is why in the second step, you have to treat it with hydronium, and that does a proton transfer, and we end up with the carboxylic acid, like that, okay? I don't know, can you see it over here? Plus, you end up, um, uh, yeah, you end up with the carboxylic acid. Anyhow, so, so let's move on from there. As I told you, you can also hydrolyze an ester under acidic conditions. It doesn't have any fancy name, like saponification or anything like that. It's just called the hydrolysis of an ester and acid. Um, again, you just take acid, H3O+, plus, treat it with um, your ester, and you end up with the carboxylic acid and methanol. The mechanism is what you would expect under acidic conditions and is the reverse of the Fischer esterification. So if you followed me in the mechanism for the um, for the Fischer esterification, this is literally just the reverse. And that's based on something called the principle of microscopic reversibility. That a reaction mechanism in one direction is going to be the exact same mechanism in the opposite direction. Let's take a look. This is the hydrolysis of an ester in acidic conditions. First, we do a proton transfer. Then we can do a nucleophilic attack by water. And now we eject the alcohol as a leaving group after the two successive proton transfers. We do another proton transfer to render or to produce our neutral carboxylic acid in the end. This is another one of those mechanisms that you want to be sure to take a good look at before stepping into the quiz or into the examination room.
other reactions of esters. This one's kind of a, a bit of a dark horse. We don't look at this reaction a ton. Or I wouldn't say this reaction is used a lot in organic chemistry, but it is used a little in organic chemistry, and therefore we need to know. Um, it's what we call an aminolysis reaction to form an, an amide, where we take an ester and we treat it with an amine to make an amide. So here we're using ammonia, and when we use ammonia, we end up with a primary amide, and of course we eject methanol in that case. So it says here, and I'm just reading directly off the slide, it says the overall equilibrium favors the amide formation. Amides are more stable and thus less reactive than esters. So the reaction actually is going to favor the production of the amide. However, like I said at the beginning when I opened up the slide, I said, it's not the greatest reaction. It's really slow for one thing. And so it's actually better to make an amide from an acid chloride like we looked at before, okay? Again, there's some synthetic utility with this reaction. That's why it's in here. But I would say it's not the most interesting, or not the most useful reaction, I should say, that we look at. Other things that we can do with esters, we can reduce an ester using lithium aluminum hydride and then treating that with water. And again, this could be or H3O plus, either way it works. So we can convert that ester to a primary alcohol. This is a reaction that we looked at earlier on in the alcohols chapter, right? We covered this in chapter 12. If you don't believe me, you can go back and take a look. We even looked at the mechanism. We looked at this mechanism in detail in chapter 12. So we actually studied this mechanism before, the nucleophilic attack by the hydride, the loss of the methoxide as the leaving group. We produce an aldehyde, which undergoes a second nucleophilic attack. And then in the second step, we treat it with water or acid. So the first steps, are these ones here, and the second step is this one here. Now, if you're wondering about converting an ester to an aldehyde, we saw how to convert an acid chloride and an acid anhydride into an aldehyde. We used um, uh, uh, lithium tridubutoxy aluminum hydride. Well, to do it with an ester, you use DIBA. OK, which I'd never seen this acronym D-I-B-A-H until I moved to the States. In Canada, we always call it Dibal H. So we always call it D-I-B-A-L-H. And it stands for diisobutyl aluminum hydride. I guess this, this one works, too. I've been using it for a number of years here. So you have two isobutyl groups and then aluminum hydride. So diisobutyl aluminum hydride. So you treat your ester with diisobutyl aluminum hydride followed by water. And then you can convert the ester directly to the aldehyde. Okay, so it's a little different than the reactions that we saw with the acid chloride and the acid anhydride. Um, what about the reaction with the Grignard reagent? Well, this again is something that we saw earlier on when we looked at the alcohols chapter. This again comes from chapter 12. When we took an ester and we treated it with excess Grignard, we could make a tertiary alcohol. It adds two R groups. We actually looked at the mechanism for that in chapter 12 as well. Here's the mechanism. This is just a rehash of chapter 12. Again, this is nothing but review. We covered this like in the second week this summer. Um, you have the nucleophilic attack. You lose the alkoxide here. That's your first leaving group. Then you do another nucleophilic attack and then a proton transfer and you end up with your tertiary alcohol. So again, our mechanism that we saw in chapter 12. Well, with all that in mind, that brings us to a question where we have to answer some questions about um, esters and their reactivity. So let's take a peek here. We have an ester. We're treating it with excess lithium aluminum hydride followed by treatment with water. Again, you could use acid. And this is a review from chapter 12. So what are we going to do? We're going to convert that ester to a primary alcohol, let's draw the primary alcohol, and this would be it. You're also going to be left over with methanol in this case. In the next one, we're treating our ester with excess methyl Grignard. So we're going to add two ethyl groups. Right? We're going to add two ethyl groups, and we're going to replace the methoxy group. So that's going to look like this. We end up with a tertiary alcohol. We have one ethyl group, two ethyl groups, and then we're going to end up with methanol as well. In the next one, in the first step, 
We're treating it with sodium hydroxide. That's going to give us sodium benzoate, which would be this. So we end up with sodium benzoate in the first step. Then you're treating it with ethyl iodide in the next step. So this is ethyl iodide. This is step two. So in the second step, you have a nucleophilic attack, loss of leaving group, and you would end up with ethyl benzoate, which would be this ester. So there's your ethyl group. And then in the last one, you have an ester. This is a lactone, right? When you have a cyclic ester, you have a lactone. You're doing the same thing you did here, excess ethyl Grignard, followed by treatment with water. But this is our electrophilic carbon here, and this is the leaving group that's going to leave. So what's that going to look like? We're going to end up with our aromatic ring. We're going to have the carbonyl carbon. Now it's going to be a tertiary alcohol. We've got one ethyl group, two ethyl groups. Then you have one, two carbons dangling off here. So we have one, two carbons, and then we're going to have our alcohol over here like that. And so those are the products of all of those reactions. The next one asks us to propose a mechanism for that same, uh, or no, sorry, this is a, um, uh, the hydrolysis of an ester. We're starting it with a lactone, which again is a cyclic, a cyclic ester, but it's asking us to draw the acid hydrolysis of an ester. So this is again, acid hydrolysis, hydrolysis of an ester. So the first step is going to be the proton transfer. Let's write out the Lewis structure for hydronium. So first step, you need to draw on some lone pairs here. There we go. First step is a proton transfer. Let's draw what that's going to look like. So we're going to end up with our lactone. Except now we've got a protonated carbonyl, so it's highly reactive. That means that water is going to be able to come in as a nucleophile now. So water is going to be a nucleophile. So let me just draw a water molecule over here. And I'll use a different color curved arrow. And we end up with a nucleophilic attack like this. And let's draw the tetrahedral intermediate, which is going to look like this. Now we've got this, and we have this here like that. So next we're going to do a proton transfer. So let's do that proton transfer. Water again. And we're going to deprotonate here. We just do it over here instead. There we go. That's a little cleaner. Then we end up with this interesting intermediate here. Okay, where we kind of have two hydroxyl groups on the same carbon like that. Now, we still need to open up that ring. And so the first step kind of towards opening up the ring will be protonation of this oxygen here. So we're going to draw another molecule of hydronium, which is going to do a proton transfer like this. And then you're going to see why the ring is going to pop open. So we end up with this, where we have our positive charge here. And we've got our hydroxyl group here. We have another one here. And then what's going to happen is a lone pair is going to cause that to leave as a leaving group like this. And then we end up with the ring opening up. So we end up with this intermediate, which is going to look like this. I'm going to draw it the way I have it kind of oriented. It should be like this. So we have a positive charge here. Then we have one, two carbons. So let's draw those, one, two. And we have our hydroxyl like this. And then in the very last step, we have another proton transfer where water comes in and grabs this proton. And there you have it. And there is your acid hydrolysis of an ester.